There is Mr. Dan James. Hello. Steve. Oh, hi, Jeff. Hello, everyone. People are getting in. Good to see everyone. Fantastic. Some people. Awesome. So we're getting set up. If this is your first time at a webinar with the Reimagine team, welcome, 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 welcome. If you've Thank been here you. Super before, excited. How this goes? Get the chat open up. Tell us where you're coming from. Should be able to click chat down there at the bottom. You're going to want to make sure that you turn the little blue thing where you're chatting that it says all panelists and attendees. Uh, that just uh, allows everybody to see what you're talking about as we get going. We'll get started here in about three minutes. It's good. Thank you for spending your Thursday afternoons with us. Fulton High School. Awesome. Camus Pasco, Enumclaw. Good to see people coming from around the state. Stanwood. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. This is great. Uh, the webinar. So this is a little bit different than you might be used to in a Zoom meeting. If this is your first time ever using a webinar, we've got this cool other button down in your bar down there called the question and answer button. And that is where we, during today's talk with Dan James, uh, if you have questions that you would like Dan to kind of maybe answer or think through um, uh, at the end, you can add your questions over there. That's where we'll be gathering your questions during this talk. You can also have the opportunity, and this is the cool thing about webinars, you can't do in a meeting. You'll have the opportunity that if you're in that question and answer section, if somebody has an answer or a question and you really like that question, you can upvote it. And then we'll start with the ones at the end of this. We'll start with the ones that have the most upvotes. Uh, so as you get over there, so you're gonna wanna open that up. So welcome everyone. We're up to 23 people in climbing. Good to see you all here coming in from Okanagan, Mount Vernon. Nacelli, that's new to me. Oh, it's been there before. Kennewick, Port Angeles. That's great. Bremerton, very cool. Very cool. About two minutes left. Thank you for spending your Thursdays with us. Thursday afternoon, early evening here, in Pacific Northwest. Um, did it actually rain today? I didn't get outside today. I didn't even see the outside today. I don't even know if it rained. It was supposed to kind of rain here today. Priest Lake, Idaho. Woo woo. It's been a long time since I've been to Priest Lake. Thank you, Juliet, for being here. Appreciate it. So again, Please make sure that down at the bottom, uh, on my screen it's blue. I don't know what color it might be on your device, but right next to where you're typing your message, there's a little blue box that says all panelists and attendees, or it says all panelists. You might wanna change that to say all panelists and attendees so that as we're having our talk today, everybody can see. Rained in Bothell, now very cloudy and humid. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't even know if it rained here today. I haven't been out cloudy, cloudy and humid, it makes me feel like I'm back in Minnesota. There you go. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so we're gonna get started here. Again, the Q&A, that's another button down there. It should be another button down there in your bar is the Q&A button. That is where is your opportunity to ask questions uh, that Dan can answer at the end of this talk. Dan's gonna go for roughly an hour uh, talking about the, the art of, of connection, the art of communication. Uh, he'll be talking about that for about an hour. Uh, we'll be over in the chat. I'll be in the chat kind of helping to moderate stuff. I can be asking you questions to clarify things as we get going here. Uh, and then you, please use the question and answer section and we'll be uh, hanging out afterwards and answering some of your questions. That is your space as we get going here today. And with that, Mr. Dan James, good to have you in the house, my friend. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. And when I say actually to have you in the house, people need to know, Dan... <laughs> Both Dan and I, Dan and I are good friends, and both of us are under uh, renovations in our house. So when I say, it's glad to have you in the house, Dan is in the basement, and I'm up on the third floor, and so we're literally in the house together, only social distancing across three floors of the house, 
because uh, he happens to be at the part of the renovation where I have internet and he doesn't, so he's here. <laughs> so it's good. I don't, I don't, I don't know what it says that we can't be in the same room, six feet apart, to work together. I don't know what that says about our friendship. <laughs> but yeah, we can, well, we, we can move people. forward from there. Yeah. Well, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, let's get started. I'm excited. Well, I'm, I'm really excited. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan James. Uh, I am the Chief Impact Officer and founder of Story19 Consulting. Uh, and I am basically a, a communications leadership consulting firm working with everything from corporate to sport to, to now education. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand I've spent most of my life trying to avoid education. Uh, my, my background is my father was a superintendent. My mother was a teacher. My sister is a teacher. My other sister has her teaching degree. My two nieces are teachers. My aunt was a teacher. And my cousin is a teacher. Uh, and so I, I have been blessed to be surrounded by education my whole life. Um, and so I'd, I'd just like to thank Jeff and, and Reimagine Why Ed for having me and including leadership uh, in what is this really transformational period for, for all of us. Um, I'm really excited today to, to share some concepts in leadership, especially as it relates to virtual leadership. Uh, but I do have a request of everybody. And that is your participation. And I know that we're in a virtual setting. And so that chat function is really important uh, because I want each of you to, to be fairly vulnerable today, to really look at yourselves and, and to think about, hey, what is my voice? What is my impact? And, and what am I trying to accomplish? Um, why are we here today? Well, we're really, we're really here for, for two reasons. One, for you, for your voice, uh, in getting really comfortable with yourself as a leader. The second thing is to really examine connections. What does it mean to connect in a virtual world as a leader? How do I engage with the people that I'm leading? And lastly, how do I form clarity in feedback and accountability? How do I make sure that everybody is on the same page? And we're gonna go through those three steps. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do today is try to connect to each other. Uh, it's really important. And you've all done an icebreaker and we all hate them. So we'll do a really, really quick one. Um, and that is in the chat function, and Jeff, you and I can do it uh, verbally. I want you to just type in one sentence about yourself that makes you unique. So everyone grab your, grab your keyboard. Uh, and I wanna see a bunch of really unique sentences. And I did this uh, at, a, at an HR corporate function and the best one so far was that their great, great grandmother survived the Titanic. Uh, and so I challenge everybody, I challenge everybody to go beyond the Titanic. Here we go. Jeff, what, what, what makes you unique? Um, I think what makes me unique is that I have been able to travel to, uh, I think we're at 57 different countries and be able to uh, live in and experience other cultures by actually living in those cultures for an extended period of time. Not just like visiting China, but like living there for three years. So you get this, there's a different sense that, you know, when you visit a place versus actually living in a culture for a while. So I, I think that's yeah. a pretty unique, unique thing. That's, that's really awesome. So I think the, the one unique thing about, about me, especially at this stage in my life, is I am the first person in the world to make coaching wheelchair tennis a full-time job. Uh, and, and so, and Jeff, you took way more than one sentence, by the way. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, it's all right. Uh, Jeff, do you see the chat? Read, read some of these. Yeah. Great. These are awesome. I love this. I've been to North and South Korea. How often Ooh. do you say that? My gosh. I've been to the DMZ. I didn't make it North. I rode a camel for five days in India. <laughs> <These are awesome. laughs> oh, I saw I someone who lived in Africa for 10 years, Australia. No way. The Irish one is awesome. <laughs> this is could crazy. take the this this could take the whole hour, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> ah. Okay, everybody. I think I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, <laughs> you have to be kidding me. Physically ran into a moose rounded corner. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, evidently there's a lot of unique people here, which, which I'm very excited about. Uh, Megan, I'm gonna give you my address. If you don't need any of those pies, let me know. 
I'd be, I'd be fine to take one off your hands. Um, all right, everybody. So, so hang tight for just a second. One of the reasons we're doing this connection exercise um, is a, it's really fun to read all these interesting things. Um, and the quick question that I would ask is how many of the people you're leading know this about you? And it's a really important question. You'll notice that not one person wrote anything about your job. Not one person wrote anything about your school. Not one person wrote anything about your job description. We so often forget in the work setting that connection is not about work. Connection is personal. And as you, as you form connections with the people that you're leading, it is absolutely critical that you are vulnerable enough to give a piece of yourself. Well, let's talk about vulnerability for just a second. Vulnerability is not opening up your heart and your emotions. Vulnerability is the willingness to give pieces of yourself to make connections. And it is critical that you allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to share with the people you're leading. As we get into the, the presentation a little bit further, we're gonna find out about buy-in stories and persuasion. Uh, but the first thing as a leader you want people to buy into is you. And so it is absolutely critical that you give them a piece of you. Not all of you, it still work, but you have to be willing to give a piece of you no matter what you're doing. And I really encourage you to take a look at yourself uh, and, and take a look at the communication that you've had so far with people you're leading and ask yourself, what have I given my team? What have I offered them of me? So they actually know me. They understand why I lead the way I lead. They understand my background and, and where I'm coming from because that common ground is incredible. And that buy-in is motivation to follow you. And so if we keep going along that line of connection, we wanna talk a little bit about the idea of personalizing your voice. In every engagement I do at Story19 Consulting, the first thing we do, whether you are a CEO, a superintendent, or a beginning tennis pro, we talk about personalizing your voice. And that is the idea of believing in who you are. So I'm gonna ask you to jump on the chat function again, and we're gonna talk for a second just about leadership, strictly leadership. I want everyone to type at least one word that you associate with leadership. On your mark, get set, type. Love it, compassion, respect, empathy, accountability, gratitude. Oh, this is fantastic. Look at this. Oh, this team is way ahead of other teams I work with. Oh, bold and brave, thank you. That is fantastic. All right, we've had, we've had a whole bunch of words typed in and, and thank you for doing that. Now, if someone would be brave enough to answer, which one is right? This is a very smart group, all of them, all of them. And here's the reality. Situational leadership is a very popular trend and it's the idea of, of showing the right empathy, the right strength in, in the situation that you're in. But the reality is each of us is different. And I'd love to tell you a really quick story. I was the tournament director of the US Open wheelchair competition at the US Open Grand Slam. And I was incredibly nervous when I got that role. And so I, I, I had a meeting with the, the tournament director, David Brewer. He's a, he's a tournament director of the entire US Open. He's on television all the time. And I'm thinking this guy is amazing. This guy has the strength. He went to a military high school. He was a taskmaster, everyone respected him. And I told myself, this is how I'm going to lead. I am going to emulate slash copy David Brewer to be the best leader I can be. And the problem was, I'm not David Brewer. In fact, my personality is very different. I'm much more of, of a motivator, inspirational, fun, um, and so I failed miserably. Um, and I learned very quickly that you cannot lead in a vision of what leadership is or to try to emulate someone else, but you actually have to believe in your own voice. You have to trust that your stories, your delivery, and your voice is good enough. In fact, when you are your authentic self, when you are truly being you, that person is an amazing leader. That person is meant to lead large teams. Um, and so again, the one thing that I, I would love to leave with you on that front is, is that pay attention to how you communicate. Pay attention to how you're interacting with those you lead. Do you feel like it is your authentic self? 
Are you vulnerable enough to admit mistakes? Are you vulnerable enough to, to encourage others? Because when you are authentic, again, people will trust that. Whether, whether it's perfect or not, that just doesn't matter. Whether your delivery is perfect. Some of you are amazing public speakers. Some of you may not be. Some of you are gregarious and, and, and verbose. Some of you are introverts. It is all amazing. Leadership does not come in a very small lane in which you have to lead in a very specific way. Great leaders are truly themselves and they empower and embolden people in their own style. And so I really encourage you almost as a homework assignment as you move forward to really examine how you've been communicating with your teams. Does it feel authentic? Does it feel like you're really being your true self? And I would encourage you to absolutely trust that because it is critical. The other part of that, the other part of what I do at, at Story19 Consulting is I engage people in their ultimate impact. Um, and I believe you've received a, a glossary of terms, but I wanna talk about ultimate impact for just a second because it, it will come across your life in many different fashions. The ultimate impact is the overarching goal of anything that you're doing. Ah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, the overarching goal of, of what you're doing. Uh, it could be if, if the goal is to onboard new teachers, the ultimate impact may be to ensure that they know the culture, rules, and regulations of the school. That's super simple. But I want to go a little bit bigger than that, and I want everyone to actually take a little bit of time. And I want you to think about who you are as a leader and why you're leading. Why are you leading? And that is your ultimate impact. In 10 years, in 20 years, your teachers, your school, your students, if you're a teacher, are going to come back to you and they're going to tell you how you impacted them. What you want them to say in that moment is your ultimate impact. And if you aren't familiar with your ultimate impact in one sentence or maybe two, you don't necessarily have a foundation of why you're leading. So I'm going to give everybody just a couple of minutes and I want you to pause and I want you to think about what your ultimate impact is. And I want to take some time and I want you to be vulnerable with this. Um, and before you do, I'm going to tell you about my transition uh, with Ultimate Impact in wheelchair tennis. And, and for those of you who don't know, my initial career was the national manager and U.S. Paralympic coach of, of wheelchair tennis. And I coached at the Sydney, Athens, Beijing, London, and Rio Games. And when I first started this career, my ultimate impact was to become the greatest wheelchair tennis coach in the world. Bar none. That was what was important to me. It was very self-driven. It was very results-driven. And we were at a junior camp with about 20 kids in wheelchairs from all over the world. Um, and I was coaching. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I, the energy was out there. I was making a difference and their tennis was getting better. And one of, my, one of my assistant coaches came up to me and literally said, Dan, shut up. What do you mean shut up? I'm coaching. This is amazing. Shut up, Dan. So I shut up. And I looked and I watched the 18-year-old kids in wheelchairs mentoring the 12-year-olds. I watched this interaction and I watched the learning happening by association, kids coming together and teaching each other. And I realized that my ultimate impact had nothing to do with being the greatest coach, medals or anything else. My ultimate impact was to use wheelchair tennis to create a vehicle for those kids to find their best self. I didn't know that. I didn't know that's what I really wanted to do. But in that moment, that became my ultimate impact. So as you sit and you type or even write at your desk, wherever you are, I want you to think about the legacy you want to leave as a leader. I want you to think about the difference you want to make, and I don't want you to judge it. Some may be to be the, the, the most organized school in, in the state of Washington. Some may have something to do with, with developing teachers. I don't care what it is, but I want it to be genuine, and I want it to have an association to everything else you do in your work. So right now, everybody, take the time Write down your ultimate impact, and if you're comfortable, please share. And Jeff, I will be calling on you for, for Reimagine Why Ed and what your ultimate impact is, so you better be ready. Oh, Jewel, thank you. Love it.
These are fantastic. They're all great. Jeff, are you able to catch these as we go through these? Uh, yes, we'll save the chat at the end and the chat will be available uh, that we make the chat available as part of the recording afterwards so people can go back and see these. Uh, but also just know as a participant, oh. if you want to capture these at the end, uh, every participant can save the chat. It's the three little dots down where you type and then you'll see in there there's a save chat option. So if you want to save this for yourself, you, you have the right to do that. I would encourage everyone to, to keep reading these. They're incredible. Just, just incredible. <clears throat> John, great. One of, the, one of the most amazing things when we do this exercise, especially in a group setting, uh, is, is that you suddenly realize that, that everybody is wanting to leave an impact. Uh, it may be different vehicles. I've seen some technology things. I've, I've seen some things about past. Um, sharing with other teachers, developing teachers. All of these have their own unique spin, but every single one of these so far has actually been impact-based. So again, as much like the connection exercise, this had absolutely nothing to do with your job description and your task list. It had absolutely nothing. As a leader, as a teacher, whatever it is, your ultimate impact actually had nothing to do with, with what your job description is. It's an overarching impact you want to leave and your job description, your task are just the vehicle. And why is ultimate impact important? Because in our daily life, and I want to mark right now that you are in the midst of one of the most difficult times, perhaps in the history of education. As leaders, as teachers, this transformation is requiring an incredible pivot. It, it is not easy. And, and I think we should mark that. I, I think we should be able to say this is tough. The ultimate impact is important because it is what you hold on to as your foundation. When you're not sure what direction, when you're not sure why, turn back to your ultimate impact and say, hey, can I do a direct line to what I'm, what I'm doing today to my ultimate impact? Is there a relationship? And can I feel good about what I'm doing? Because again, as we go back to your authentic voice and being truly who you are, there has to be a relationship to this ultimate impact. Here's the amazing thing. Uh, every smaller goal, every smaller thing that you do will have an ultimate impact. And we'll get into that later with one of the tools that I use. Uh, but as we go through the rest of this presentation, as we go through the exercises, I think it is really important that you hold on to what you just wrote. And you hold on to the fact that in two years, it may evolve. Your ultimate impact is, is, is going to be different. If I asked you 10 years ago what your ultimate impact was, it would not be the same as it is today. I can assure you that when I was in my 20s, uh, I'm not even sure I had an ultimate impact. Uh, and, and so allow it to evolve, but always be aware of it because it is the foundation of your leadership style. It is the foundation of what you're choosing to do. And I think it's really, really important. I wanna transition uh, quickly here. And, and again, I encourage everybody, if you have questions, get those in the, the Q&A. Uh, if it's really pressing, you can throw it into the chat and, and Jeff can maybe help me take a look at those. Uh, but I want to transition to storytelling as a, as a leader. Most, uh, I think everybody here has the academic background and knows how important stories are uh, as it relates to learning. But I want to define what a story is as it relates to leadership, uh, as, as it relates to a vehicle to understanding. When I do this in a corporate setting and I ask people, hey, what's a story? I get the, the most English lit answers ever. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, there's a hero, there's a foil, uh, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, uh, there's a plot, there's a plot twist, um, there's a happy ending. Uh, that's not a story as it relates to leadership. The story is absolutely anything that you can use to create understanding. Each of you is a teacher, whether you are a superintendent, a principal, a teacher, we all teach. And we all have to deliver understanding as leaders because clarity and being on the same, same page is pivotal to leadership. So what, what is a story? It's analogy. And in one of my favorite examples, it's a spreadsheet. Now, how can a spreadsheet be a story? Well, it's, it's super important. And, and if I look at, at my ledger this year with, with COVID-19, um, 
I'm about where I was supposed to. Oh, great. Another, another uh, ultimate impact. I love it. Um, if I use my ledger as, as a story for all of you about the challenges of COVID-19, uh, by March, every client I had had canceled their contracts. And so if you just would have looked at my ledger and said, that business is failing because we're at zero. Without understanding that, that we had a pandemic, the story is actually the comeback within my ledger as, as COVID-19 has affected our businesses. So I can, I can use that, that data to tell the story of my business. You can use test scores as, as a story of improvement, of development, not just the results, they're a story. Anything that creates understanding is a story. Uh, but I think it's really important as leaders to understand there are four kinds of stories. And it's, it's very important to differentiate. Uh, the four kinds of stories are persuasion, motivation, connection, and information. I'm gonna go through those again. Persuasion, connection, information, motivation. And you can use anything in those four formats to make an impact on your team. Why is it important to understand those four styles of storytelling as a leader? Because you have the responsibility to connect to your team by choosing the right story. Right now, I'm imagining there's a lot of buy-in. You're working with Reimagine Why Ed. This is a large pivot. And so we have to use persuasion. This is where we circle back into impact and empathy. As leaders, you choose stories that are empathetic to the people that you're leading. It is critical. And we use this thing called the relationship wheel. And what is the relationship wheel? Whether you're doing a presentation, having an interpersonal dialogue, uh, or just teaching in a class, relationship wheel starts with the people believing you are authentic in your presentation of content. They actually believe in you. The second thing is that they believe in, in the impact you're making. And it is, it is absolutely critical. And so as we look at these different things, the, the, the relationship wheel can only turn if you've created a relationship, if you've created a connection. We're circling all the way back to the beginning of the presentation. We're circling back to the idea of making a connection. So if I'm telling a story, if I'm trying to connect to someone, that relationship between the speaker, the audience, and the content or the impact is irreplaceable. All three have to be in place. What does that mean for you as a leader? When you choose your stories, you cannot think in your terms. We have this language barrier between leadership and those we lead because as leaders, we tend to forget to think about who we're speaking to. We tend to think in terms of, I know this information, I've got to deliver this information, and so I'm just going to tell it. The next thing that happens is that we absolutely forget that, that there is an impact on the people we're leading. And so as you choose stories, you have to choose stories that actually impact the people you're leading. That boils down to something super, super simple. And that is the what versus the so what. And this is the crux of connection. We spend all day as leaders dealing in curriculum, administration, um, whatever it is that, that is there. And we have a tendency to want to deliver that information. And, and the informative story is great. The problem is we're in the midst of a time frame in which we need buy-in. We absolutely have to get parents, teachers, other administrators to buy in to this incredible pivot. We have to use a persuasive story. How do you choose a story? Do you choose it based on your knowledge or do you choose it based on the knowledge that others have and what impact is going to affect them? So, Jeff, if I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready? Uh, sure. I'll give it a go. <laughs> All right. So, so you obviously have, have been incredibly busy uh, over the last few months. Um, and, and you right now have to tell me a success story that's going to get me buy-in to changing the way that I teach in a really short matter. It is your, it is your, your story elevator pitch in two minutes or less. Um, so I would say the story that I would tell is that we have students in this state 
that actually graduated, met their graduation requirements because of distance learning, that they were not going to graduate if school remained the way it was. And because of distance learning, it created an opportunity for these kids to actually graduate high school. And we have to understand that the system that we had before wasn't perfect. It wasn't running, it wasn't working for every single kid. And to understand that distance learning is gonna work for some kids. And how do we take the best of both worlds and bring them together when that time and place allows? It's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, everybody, I want you to, to, to just pause for a moment. Um, and you're all in the midst of a pivot and, and it's really important. Um, and I want you to think of the impact that's going to get buy-in to what you're doing. I think it is really, really important that we're able to share the impact first. And, and so that's where we get into the what versus the so what. So Jeff just gave me the so what. Jeff basically led his, his first sentence, said we are getting kids to graduate through distance learning. Full stop. That is the so what. The process is the what. And, and so again, as leaders, when we're trying to persuade, when we're trying to get buy-in, it is challenging to get people to change. And again, I want to mark that, that this, this, this trying time has everybody at pivoting and not everybody's on board. And if you do not have a good persuasive story, if you do not have something that can get people on board by showing an impact, not only for the kids, but for them. What is the positive impact in this story for them? There's a tendency to want to make that positive impact about the school, solely about the kids. There has to be a way to make it a positive impact for them. What Jeff is doing is making distance learning easier for the teachers as well. That's an important impact. Uh, and I think it's really critical that each of you, as you try to get buy-in, can do that. So let's go back to the, the four stories. Let's go back to the four kinds of stories. You know, so the first thing we did was talk about connection. And, and we talked about on a personal level, being able to be vulnerable enough to connect. The, the second part of this uh, is, is the information. Well, that's the what, and that's probably gonna go last. You know, the, the persuasive combined with the motivation, that's where real change occurs. That's where we get buy-in and people to follow us. And so as leaders, that persuasive and motivational story is critical. And it's going to make a huge difference in the way that folks come with us. Let's pause full, full stop and say, okay, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm leading in a virtual world. And this has fundamentally changed. And, and I understand the challenge. When I took over the job at the United States Tennis Association, uh, I lived in Minnesota. My office was in New York. I was managing 17 offices across the U.S. and players from Hawaii to Maine. Uh, I did not have anybody that was, that was on my team. And I want to talk for just a second about, about failure uh, because I think as leaders, it's really, really important. Um, and I know Jeff and I have, have spoken about this quite often. Uh, Jeff, what, do, what, do you, what is your saying about, about failure? I'm going to put you on the spot again just for fun. Fail fast, fail loud, baby. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I take a little different spin on it. And I, I talk about proactive failure. Um, the, one, the one thing that is inevitable is failure. I love fail fast, fail loud, coming for Shannon. Yes. Um, I wish your typing was louder. That would have been very helpful. Uh, but I, I, I want to talk about proactive failure because I think it's really important. As leaders, we have to give feedback and, and we have to, to be able to talk to people about their failures. Um, we used to, on the, on the teams that, that I coached uh, and with my coaching staff, had Friday failure meetings where we sat around and we literally discussed the best failure of the week and what we did about it. And, and there were times that it was hilarious. Uh, there was one time where someone who worked for me accidentally got her team's social security numbers out into the public. Um, that one wasn't nearly as funny uh, and actually required some legal action. Bottom line is there's going to be failure. So what are the, what are the tenants we're looking for? And, and that goes back to that motivation. Is it, is it based on, on proactive action? Have we agreed on what we're doing? Was it in the plan? Did I have a plan? You know, was I putting forth the effort? And it's a really important question to ask because if all the answers are yes, that's beautiful failure. That is success. 
And then obviously the secondary question is, well, what did you learn? The danger is, especially in a virtual world, we learn from our mistakes. Thank you, Carolyn. I could not agree more. We get better. Um, just as, as, as a quick, and you can do this at home because I don't need to know. Anybody fail today? Just so you know, I failed today. Um, thank you, Shannon. Yes, um, I, definitely, I definitely failed today. Uh, and, and I do every day and, and I embrace it. I celebrate it um, because it's, it's what's made all of us better. It is, it is that pain, it is, it is that bounce that, that helps us to learn. And it's actually an incredible concept in, in, in education um, because as, as leaders, we're taught from the very beginning that failing or making a mistake is not a positive thing. It, but as leaders, we absolutely have to embrace failure. And, and the most important thing, and I wanna kind of transition a little bit into this idea of leading in a virtual world. It is even more difficult to allow for failure as we, as we change. I could not agree. If you are not failing, you are not learning. Amen. Uh, I agree. The problem is that, that as we get into a virtual world in which we are inundated with Zoom meetings, emails, telephone calls, we're missing a really important part of failure, of connection, of, of meeting in the teacher's lounge and laughing of, about the fact that I missed it, an entire two pages of the curriculum today, uh, and I'm going to have to try to sneak it in tomorrow, uh, whatever it is whatever that failure is. You know, for, for, for me, asking someone to present when they weren't ready. Uh, we miss that personal connection. And, and so what happens when we're here in this virtual world? The first thing is that what we're missing is connection. So whether it's virtually, whatever it is, make time. It takes you approximately six seconds to ask a personal question as you start your emails to your staff. It takes you uh, approximately six seconds on a Zoom call to ask ab ab about Roger's daughter's game. And we would do that in the office, but we're not doing that now because we're inundated and we feel overwhelmed, but we still need that connection. People need to feel a connection to each other. They need to feel a connection to you. It is critical. Um, but let's talk about Zoom for just a second. Um, by by you know, just yes or no, who's tired of virtual meetings? Type away, yes or no. Anybody tired of virtual meetings? <laughs> I, I'm even more appreciative that you're here, by the way. Not yet, oh, Carl, good. Carl, Carl's good, just getting started, all right. Headache again today. Maria, thank you, it does still add connection. One of the things that, that I'm going to encourage you to do is, is to moderate what I call, I'm sure many people call it video chat fatigue. It is a real thing. Um, and, and having Zoom meetings all day is just too much for everybody. There's a theory of diminishing returns, especially in, in sports. Uh, and that means that if, if, I am, if I am trying to build muscle then, and I lift weights, if I lift the same weight the same way, initially I'm gonna show great improvement. I'm gonna be able to lift more, I'm going to add weight. The problem is if I continue to do that the same way, there is a diminishing return. Initially the increase is less. And all of a sudden now I plateau and eventually it goes down. I don't know of a human alive who can maintain this video chat mantra uh, the way we're doing right now. And so as leaders, you have the ability to control that that is, uh, especially as it relates to meetings, especially as it, as it relates to that interaction. I would really encourage you to ensure that, that people are taking time away from video chat, that people have time to actually do their work and engage. Um, and, and we can go back to, to even some quick telephone calls or just emails. But this idea of being face-to-face -face on the screen all the time is wearing everybody out. Decide whether it's super important to have the camera on or off. If you have to have a meeting, do I have to have the camera on or off? There are some meetings where it's critical. There are some meetings where you need to be able to see reactions. People need to interact. But if we go back to the informative story, there are also times where, you know what? Let's hop on this, stay in your sweats, Eat your, eat your Cheerios, be comfortable. 
but be cognizant to the point of actually asking your teams, hey, how are you doing? Are you tired? Are you worn out? Um, and I can assure you that, that, especially in the group meetings, it is taxing. They're tough to follow. And so I just want everyone to be really, really conscious that in Carl is, is now commenting on the Zoom classes. I'm not going to get into that. That is not my lane, Carl. Um, Jeff and I have spoken about, about all day Zoom classes and, and I assure you we are on the same page. Um, it's too much. The other thing that happens when, when we have the sense that we have to be together all the time, when do people get to work? When do they get to create? When do we get to be our best? Because I'm gonna promise you right now, unless we're in a one-on-one, uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting in Zoom where we're collaborating, but we're just having a meeting, we're not at our best. We have to create space for growth and development, whether it's our students, our staff, our peers, there has to be time and space in a virtual world for growth and development. There also has to be time for filling our own cup. And we're missing that in this virtual world. One of my clients in a biotech industry came to me one day and, and just said, I'm done, I'm quitting. I don't wanna do this anymore. I was a little taken aback. I said, okay, hold on. Why? Well, I'm on Zoom meetings from 5.30 in the morning until 7 p.m. I don't have time to do my work and I'm exhausted. I said, well, okay. Have you brought that to your leadership? And have you actually identified the things that fill your cup to give you the energy to get through this, this trying time? Uh, and, and in two weeks, his leaders actually said, no, we won't do that anymore, it's too much. And he actually started to keep a chart of what he's doing for himself because video chat is so taxing. And so again, there's, there's two things in this. Number one, monitor how much video time you have. People need time and space to grow and develop, especially if you're challenging them in this new time where they're learning a new way to connect to students. Give them time and space. The second thing is, how are you encouraging them to fill their cup during the stressful time? How are you encouraging them to have a personal gain that is critical to having the energy to do this every day? And are they keeping a chart? I literally have two, two clients who keep charts on what they do. One of them promised I'm gonna do meditation and read for half an hour every morning. And literally has to keep a chart because he's so busy and so worn out. What are you doing to encourage them to fill their cup so that they're there? One of the most amazing things that I've, I've ever heard is this idea of, of effort. Um, and I was doing a presentation at, at Deloitte and the senior manager of the, of the Seattle office said, Dan, I have a question for you about effort. And I got very nervous because he was the boss. Uh, and he said, I wanna, I wanna clarify something. Effort is not time. And went, Wait a second, what? Yeah, effort is not time. You can give me 60 hours and only put out 20 hours of work. You can be engaged with students but only be giving 60% of yourself. Effort is a combination of time and energy. If we as leaders are not paying attention, especially in this virtual setting, in this pivot, to the energy each of our staff members, each of the people we're leading has, then we're missing a pivotal part of scaling output. We're missing a pivotal part of keeping people engaged that are interacting with our students. It's really important. Um, I wanna pause for just a second. Jeff, do you wanna add to anything on that as it relates to virtual communication and interaction. No, I think everything you're saying is what we're seeing. And, and I mean, what you're hearing come up in the chat is, I mean, we know this. I think there's, a, there's different ways we're going to have to figure this out. Um, I would just be, you know, whatever your schedule is, is what your schedule is at this point in time. But if you, if you find yourself or you find that kids are in Zoom meetings six hours a day, do they have to be in a Zoom for your entire, your entire hour? You know, is, is there a way that you can structure it that maybe you have a 10 minute check in and then you're all going to go off Zoom for 15 minutes to do work and then you're going to come back. Like when we talk about being synchronous all the time, I think there are ways that you as an individual teacher hopefully can find ways that if you know that's not the right thing for you and your kids. And especially like I'm just thinking like a teacher, if you happen to be the sixth period at the end of the day, those kids are going to be wiped. How, how are you structuring that time so that it might be a little bit different? Um, and it might not be that you're on Zoom. You might spend 10 minutes on Zoom to say hi, do some community building activities, 
And then you might say goodbye to the kids and say, I'll see you at the last 10 minutes of class with, you know, a drawing that you did, or I don't know, something that you've got them working on. I think you're going to have to, we're, we're going to have to think through that a little bit. And I would just say, I would iterate what, um, reiterate what, what Dan is saying in that you got to, you got to uh, know the people in front of you and be willing to lead the people in front of you as they are. And if your kids are coming to you and they're already wiped, how are you going to adjust to that and, and not maybe do the lesson that you're going to do? Or, I mean, you got to be able to lead the kids that are in front of you. The, those are the kids you have in that moment in time and be able to, you know, meet them where they're at. I love that. Well, and I'm, I'm going to take it from a little different perspective. And I think that's dead on because everybody is getting taxed with this. And if you are in a district that requires six hours, but I would even say requires four hours, requires three hours. It's not just the kids that are worn out. There is no way as a teacher that you are as good on hour three or four as you were on hour one, because there's no recovery. And one of the things of, of leading in a virtual, teaching in a virtual world, for the kids, for the teachers, there is no recovery. Um, and, and again, if I go back to my sports analogy, your body has to recover to build. Your mind has to recover to build. And there has to be time for process. And if you're on the camera all day long, that can't happen. Um, and so I want to I want to transition out of this as as we come up closer to, to time. I want to get to feedback, and say that that it is critical. Wait, this is a good one from Sarita. I encourage you to use breakout sessions and have students use this time to relate and build relationships. Um, I want to encourage the idea of intentionality. Um, I think everybody is is intentional in parts of their job, parts of their life. Uh, I know that I have certain lanes where I'm incredibly intentional and in certain lanes where if you ask my wife, not so much. Uh, but I would encourage everybody as it relates to camera time to be incredibly intentional, to make an intentional decision as to the amount and why. If we circle back to, to the idea of impact, and we have an ultimate impact for each day that a teacher teaches, for each district and what they're trying to accomplish, have to imagine that your ultimate impact does not relate to video chat fatigue. It cannot be a positive relationship to what you're trying to accomplish. There may be days where it's necessary and that's okay. There's, there's days where you have to be there, but allow for the recovery time and make an intentional decision. Um, Jeff, thanks, thanks for your input. Um, I wanna circle back to, to, to the idea of connection as it relates to feedback. Um, and this is sort of the third and, and, and final portion of, of the webinar. Um, I don't know of anybody in a leadership position that enjoys giving negative feedback. Uh, I don't know of anyone who, who enjoys a difficult situation. So I'm not gonna tackle that yet because I don't either. I wanna talk about different kinds of feedback really, really quick. The first and, and I think the most enjoyable is teaching where, where there's an opportunity to help someone you're leading or a child and, and even though this is feedback, I think it's very specific because you are transferring knowledge and you're giving, you're giving that person ownership of the knowledge you have. And in that form of feedback, I think is really energizing. I think the other kind of feedback that is energizing is celebration. And I wanna make sure, in fact, as I was waiting for Jeff to get off staff meeting, uh, I hope I'm not calling you out, Jeff, uh, but, but he was going through celebrations with his staff uh, in things and in, in giving kudos. Everybody alive should be celebrating something, um, whether it's small or not. Uh, the first one was teaching. The first feedback uh, is teaching. Uh, the second is celebration. Uh, and, and the third is, is the tough conversation, which, which we will get to. Um, but celebration, I think, is an incredibly important part of culture. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, that includes failure. That absolutely includes failure. My, my tennis coach, would never measure me on wins and losses, ever. He would ask me three simple questions every day. Did you work hard today? Did you learn something today? Did you have fun today? And those, those were the measurements. And if I, could, if I could say yes to those three, we celebrated. You know, and if I, if I didn't have an answer, then we worked together to find one. Um, if I lost, it was the same question. We never worried about that failure. We just did celebrations all the time. And so if, if right now weekly celebrations are not part of your culture, I would really encourage you as a leader to add it because there are plenty of tough times. There, there are plenty of difficult situations, um, especially right now. It's hard. 
So if you can find the reason to celebrate, it will fundamentally impact the culture of your classroom, the culture of the teacher's lounge, and the culture of your district. It will make a difference. Uh, sorry, I, I get, uh, Jeff, I, I get caught up in your, your chats. I want to chat with everybody. Uh, now, anyway, so celebrations are really important. So obviously everyone here is a teacher. So the teaching feedback is second nature. The celebration feedback is critical. That brings us to the other kind of feedback, which nobody enjoys. And that's when there's a problem. And it does happen on occasion. And I would encourage everybody to really force yourself to look in the mirror. It's the first thing you do when there's a problem. It, it, I like to say that there are four characteristics of, of leadership that I think are, are really important. You know, and that's listening, learning, consistency, and forgiveness. I'm gonna say that again. The four characteristics of leadership are listening, learning, consistency, and forgiveness. And you're gonna notice as a communications guy, not one of those had anything to do with speaking or storytelling or telling, because that's not what the most important thing is. That part will come. But consistency is the most important thing. And that is regardless how you personally feel, everybody must be treated fairly. And I know everyone has buy into that, but it is required to be said. It is so important uh, for your subculture or your overarching culture that everyone feels like they're being treated the same. Uh, it's very important. Listening. I'm gonna tell you a story right now, and I want you to practice what I call blank slate listening. Because as a leader, I think it is the hardest thing to do. Blank slate listening means that you literally are going to blank the slate in your mind and just listen. That's it. So I'm gonna tell a very brief story about one of the worst leaders in my life. Uh, and, and I want you to attempt to not let a single thought pop into your head and just stay with me. In 1996, uh, I thought I had to get a real job and get a real life. So I took a corporate job uh, at the corporate headquarters of Target. Phenomenal company. My wife worked there. I was a merchandising analyst, which means I sat in front of a computer and pushed stock from a, from a, a distribution center to stores. I switched departments when I got placed in, in my first role. Uh, and my leader looked at me when I was struggling and said, you know, Dan, there are just some things you have to learn yourself. And when I said, I've never seen any of this, that's not my problem. There was no empathy. There was no teaching feedback. And the tough conversation happened in a negative way immediately. That was the first lesson for me in leadership of how I never wanted to lead. Uh, in, in how much of my curriculum started, and even as a coach and a leader myself. Full stop. All right, I want anyone to, to just say me, if you were able to go through that entire story without a thought popping into your head. Go chat, say no if you couldn't. Kathy, good job. <laughs> I think it's pretty much in, in, in impossible. Um, well, to be fair, it could have been a terrible story too. So, so that may not be your fault. It could have been a really boring story, uh, which again, not, not your fault. Uh, I think it's, but I think the, the point is that blank slate listening is really hard. It's also really hard as a leader when you are trying to make a point. When you have something, oh, John, that's a separate conversation. I'd like to have that one. Um, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a really important example of when you are talking to someone you lead, whether it is a student, another teacher, whatever it is, how difficult it is to actually have empathy without hearing them. Uh, my father's favorite saying, again, so there's two things that, and I think it's really important that I share this with what my father said to, to two parents. It has nothing to do with this webinar. It's just classic. Um, a student had gotten in trouble uh, and the parents came in to my father's office when he was a superintendent uh, and they said, Dr. James, my child doesn't lie. And without missing a beat, my father looked right at them and said, I have three children. I haven't believed a word they said since they were born. That's my father. Uh, and that's, that's what I grew up with. Hopefully no one had a thought come in there. Um, but the idea is you're going to have something to say. And you're going to have something you want to teach or impart. But if you don't listen and truly listen to what they're saying, you may not know how to say it. And that's really, really important. I've got nine minutes to get to the tough conversation. And I think this is, this is one of the tools that I have had to learn 
and implement myself. When there is a problem, it is important that you give that person a chance to learn and grow. Unless it's so severe that, that you have to have a tough conversation immediately, there's really a three-step process. And the first step is to not even say there's a problem, but an opportunity. And that's what we call communicating forward. And that feedback loop comes directly in and saying, hey, you know what, as, as we develop and grow, you have an opportunity to add this tool. And it's a way of positively looking in the future. If you add this, here's the impact and how great it's gonna be. But you're creating a picture of success in the future without even mentioning there's a problem, give them the opportunity to solve it themselves. Communicate that success in the future by implementing something new or change. The second thing that you have to do is identify that there's a problem. If that behavior doesn't change, you have to identify a problem. But you're gonna do, use positive framing to frame that problem in a positive way. Look, Jeff, right now we, we, we have a problem. But if you are able to do A, B, and C, this will happen, we're gonna be great. And so there's still a positive opportunity to create change. The third step, not as easy, is a tough conversation. The tough conversation occurs when they've had two chances to implement change and they haven't. And then there's a real conversation as a leader you have to have, and it shouldn't come as a surprise. If you are able to say, you were supposed to do this, you were supposed to do this, a and B, you had an opportunity, it didn't happen. Now change has to happen immediately or there are consequences. The hope is if you do a really good job of communicating forward and positive framing, you'll never get to that point. But there is a point in communication and strength and leadership where things have to move forward one way or the other. The hope again is that you don't need to. I wanna pause for just a second and say that, that as leaders, before we get to that tough conversation, this is where the mirror is very important. And this is where clarity is important. So often as leaders, we think we are closing the loop. And closing the loop is, is the act of making sure that deadlines and action items are agreed upon. It is a really important communication tool, uh, whether it's with the kids or other teachers. And we think that we gave a deadline, but we didn't. And so we're about to have a tough conversation, say, hey, where is that report card? I didn't know it was due. Ask yourself, did I give this person every opportunity to succeed? Did I close the loop and create clarity in what my expectations were? If the answer is yes, after you've looked in the mirror, then it starts to, it's time to start that three-pronged process. If the answer is no, it's an opportunity for you to create clarity. I can't emphasize enough in leadership how important closing the loop and accountability is. You cannot levy expectation without clarity. You cannot give feedback when it's not expected. Good leadership, good communication means no surprises. And if you are able to provide that for those you lead, whether it's the kids, the teachers, whoever it is, if you can create clarity, then any problem, any feedback necessary shouldn't be a surprise. And it's the responsibility of the person receiving the feedback. Um, and so that's really important. I want to just hold on. Tough conversations must give chance to, and I'm not sure what that question is, but we can circle back on that. Um, I want to. I want to just kind of go overarching with with what we've looked at today in terms of leading in the virtual world. Concepts of leadership are not changing because we're in front of a computer, we're on the phone, we're on email. We still need to connect. We need to connect to our students, we need to connect to our peers, and we need to connect to those we're leading. It is critical. That's probably very true as well, and that's a, a different conversation. And I wish, we, I wish we had time for managing up, Juliet. Uh, it's, a, it's a different conversation. Um, but make the personal connection. Be intentional moving forward about personal connection. And believe in your voice. The second thing is, is to make sure that, that you are telling the right story. There is so much need for buy-in today with, with the crucial pivot that we're all a part of in this virtual world. What is the impact that you're pushing to make a difference? And lastly, make sure that you're clear. Make sure that, that, that you are providing clarity and closing the loop before you give feedback. But as you give feedback, teach, 
celebrate and give people a chance to fix anything that might be a problem by going through that three-step process. Communicating forward, closing the loop, positive framing, and then tough conversation. Uh, Jeff, I wanna thank you and Reimagine Why Ed for having me. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm super excited about any questions you might have. Um, there's no topic that, that is off right now. Uh, and then Jeff, if there's anything else you wanna add in closing, please do. Awesome, thank you, Dan, I uh, appreciate it. There are a couple of questions over in the Q&A. And again, if there are questions that you have, uh, we're using the, the Q&A section down there at the bottom. You might see that. There's a couple over there already. I love this one awesome. from Google. Um, I think this is a really, it's a, a one we, uh, has come up a couple different times, but Jewel wrote in the question, she said she was in a, a, a PD on racial stereotyping, which is state requirement that we must do here around cultural responsiveness and racial literacy. Um, and she's just asking, you know, as, as a leader, she's saying there's a time when I was stereotyped and almost didn't join a group. I'm native. Is, is that too, uh, is it too out there for an entire staff that I only know some of I only know some of them. I'm new to the school, but know about 40 of the 120 teachers. So when you talk about impact statements and telling your story, how personal do you get and how, how well do you need to know the group? Like Jules saying she knows 40 of 120 teachers. They're talking in this PD session about racial stereotyping. Is, do you, is it, does, she, does she talk about personal stories then about time she's been stereotyped against or, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how do you do that as a leader of being able to bring in your own stories like that without seeming like you're trying to, you know, do something else? Right. I think, I think that, that first of all, my answer is always going to be yes. I believe in vulnerability. I, I believe it strengthens rather than weakens a leader. Uh, I think that that vulnerability humanizes a leader, uh, which is really important. But I also believe that, that there's a progression. Um, and, and you have to allow yourself to get out of your comfort zone slowly, uh, which, which means instead of telling your whole story, you, you may just want to say that I am Native, I have been stereotyped against, and I believe it's worthy of discussion. You may not go into your personal story, you may not, but I would love for you to be able to get there. Um, I am a firm believer that everybody's story matters, um, and I think everyone should be able to tell their story to the degree comfortable. Um, and, and again, I didn't have a chance to get into directional leadership. If you are a leader, you share your story, but you don't lean on, you're not a confident with those you, you lead. You are that for them. You can't be that for those you lead, uh, but you still share your story. Um, it also gives the people that you lead, even, even kids, an understanding of where you come from. And, and so my response is, I believe in that vulnerability. I, I think that, that it is powerful. Um, but I encourage you to, to do it, if you're not comfortable, to do it in increments. Um, but to get to the point where, where you are willing to share, because I actually, just hearing that, would love to hear that story and, 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 and be a part of making a difference to, to share that, because I think it is that important. Yeah, I love that. And I love what um, Carolyn just put, you know, my rapport with my students will be my legacy. And, and I think that's the true. I mean, one of the other questions we had, and it kind of came up there in the chat, and of course, you, you saw it as soon as you hit a nerve. When you talked about being on Zoom meetings all day, this is where teachers are right now. This is our mindset right now, Dan, is this idea of what do we do with this time with kids? And, and every, you know, I was telling another group today, um, I'm working with like 173 school districts across our, our state, and I'm seeing 173 different schedules. Everything from kids and teachers being on Zooms for six hours straight to other ones where there's hardly Zoom at all. And I think it's in between there, right? There's somewhere in between is probably the safe space, but we don't know what that is yet. And even if you are a teacher that you find yourself on a lot of Zoom stay, you heard Dan talk about this, you heard about taking care of yourself and, and really make sure you're focusing on the needs of your students. There are ways to use Zooms where you, you I think a lot of times we feel like when we're in front of kids, we have to be teaching. And how do we get through that mindset that that's not what you have to do? If you find yourself where you are in Zooms for six hours a day, don't feel like that entire time you have to be talking and you have to be, you know, direct instruction, something. Um, it was never good instruction. It's never, it never was a good instruction to stand and lecture to kids for an hour. And it's still not good instruction to do that now. So we can use that time together with kids to 
build those relationships, have those conversations, have them tell stories. I mean, there are some nuggets in here from Dan that I love about, you know, I'm just taking away, I'm constantly right now thinking of like, what are some things I can take when I'm having those with kids? So the idea of kids come into my Zoom room, first thing I'm gonna ask them is, what did you learn today? What did you have fun at with today? Did you celebrate today? What is that? Getting your kids talking around those, those ideas of mindsets, those ideas of, you know, what am I doing as a learner, I think are going to be some of the most critical things that we're going to be able to do with um, the time we have with kids in Zooms. So I think, that, I think that's a big one. I agree. And Jeff, I would just, I would just add that each of you are, are from all over the state and in Idaho um, and, and may or may not have control of that schedule. As a leader, it's also what you do at that time and how you structure it. So you may not have an, an option for what that time is, but you can be very intentional about how you use that time. Yeah. Um, and encourage people to, to step away from the camera, do some independent work. We were taught as, as coaches the progression of learning a skill. Uh, teaching is only the first step. They have to use it. They have to try it. They, they have to, that transfer of ownership of knowledge or a skill involves independent work as well. Um, and so you can never feel badly uh, about creating space for them to develop on their own because they have to own it after you're done teaching it. Yeah, so true. And I think it's something even to remind ourselves, you know, not everybody here is a teacher. And well, a lot of them are. But even as a school leader, if you have an hour Zoom meeting with your staff, how are you using that time wisely? How are you using that time to connect using that time to ask them, what did you learn today? What was fun today? What was your failure today? You know, I mean, that's our time together. And even as a, as an administrator, make sure you're using that time. Um, and even, you know, Carl brought up and said, you know, make sure you're using the power of asynchronous videos. You know, I can make a video recording to my staff about all the stuff they need to know. What I can't make a video recording of is how are you doing? I can see it in your eyes. I can wow. tell us about your failure today or your success. Let's celebrate that together. That stuff you don't do in an asynchronous video. You don't do that in an instructional video. That's our time together. And how do we make sure that we really spend that time together laughing and enjoying each other's company, even if it is in a virtual sense and we can't hug that kid, right? And, there, and that's what we're missing. That's what we're all missing. But we still have those opportunities to do this. It's not perfect, but we have those opportunities to do it here for sure. And I would really, I would really encourage everybody to get away from the mindset of, of the, the sand dial and the, the clock running out. I've got to teach these 30 things in this hour go because the, the value of taking the time to make that connection will be invaluable. It will, it will create a totally different learning environment, um, leadership environment. Uh, it is just impactful. I wonder if you have any, and this is something I've been thinking about. I know that there are a couple people in here who are tech coaches or, I mean, tech coaches are about as close as we get or instructional coaches are about as close to we get as middle management, you know, kind of those middle management jobs. And there was even, I can't remember who brought it up. Somebody brought it up in the chat, but how do you, do you have any suggestions if you're like in this like middle management kind of situations where maybe you're an instructional coach or a tech coach and you really don't have power over other people, but you have a, you have a, a boss or a leader above you uh, that isn't good in communicating in these ways, how do you go about either helping them, supporting them, or understanding where they're coming from um, when, you, when you're kind of caught in that situation? Any kind of recommendations? Yeah, so there's, and, and this is, to be honest, another hour session. Uh, it's what we call managing up, <laughs> uh, and it's 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 creating the, the relationship with leadership that allows you to make suggestions, that allows you to interact. One of the most important concepts, if you are in that middle tier, if you are caught in the middle, um, is to seize leadership moments. Mm. I'm sure that everyone in this room has seen a problem or something they want to change. Be okay with the fact that it's not in your power to make that decision. It is in your power to affect change. Uh, meaning that you need to seize a, a leadership moment. And then we go back to the storytelling. A, a leadership moment is, is the ability to tell a, a persuasive story that gets leadership to buy in to the idea you have. Um, and so one of the biggest dangers when we see a problem is to go in and complain about the problem. Uh, managing up is 100% solution oriented. Um, the only problem is that you're not the decision maker. So you may have to be okay with an edited solution you may have to be okay with a no. 
but, but don't stop doing it. But the biggest danger in that middle tier or even a lower tier as you try to manage up is, is the idea of coming and saying, there's a problem, I need you to fix it. Mm. That won't accomplish anything. What accomplishes some is, hey, I've recognized this problem and I've thought about it. Uh, here, here we have this opportunity to do A, B, and C. That's impactful. And at the very least, doesn't put someone on a defensive position and they're more willing to listen to you. But you have to bring a solution forward in part of that persuasive story. Oh, I like that. I like that. And you just make me think about, you know, even as you were saying that, I'm just reflecting on, you know, sometimes teachers can be that situation. And I'm just thinking about people are talking about their schedules and, you know, somebody else and somebody else right now happens to be those negotiating at the union schedule with, you know, administrators are creating these schedules that you as a teacher maybe didn't have any input in. And so you're feeling like this thing's coming down to you. So you have to, you're ending up in five hours of Zooms a day or four hours of Zooms a day. But do you seize an opportunity to say, okay, I have to be in these Zooms, but how I structure my time in these Zooms, that's on me. And it doesn't have to be me delivering content for an hour at a time. It could be me fulfilling this, the, the emotional needs of my kids. And one of the things that we saw last spring, this is data, not research. One of the data points we have from last spring is teachers who spent that Zoom time actually working on the things that you're talking about, building those connections, talking about the stories. Kids showed up for those classes. Kids showed up. Teachers who were trying to teach nothing but content on Zoom, we watched kids fall apart. Kids stopped coming. We saw disengagement because I don't want to go there and have somebody just talk at me and try to teach me something because it doesn't work. But we actually have data points from last spring where if you use that Zoom time to create connections, create communities, talk with your kids, ask them if they've had fun today, kids show up. And we know that we need to get kids to engage before we're going to get them to actually do the learning we need them to do. And so those Zoom meetings in my, in my world and what we've been teaching through Reimagine Wa Ed is use that time to engage kids. Right, Because once they're engaged, they'll do the work for you. But we've got to use that time in a way that actually really allows us to engage kids in meaningful conversations with each other, with us as a community of learners, and really build on that foundation first, especially in September, especially in September. That's going to be a critical piece. Because um, one of the hardest things we know, and we know this as teachers, is once a kid disengages with the educational process, it's really hard to get them to re-engage. It's really hard to get them to re-engage. We're gonna to have to capture those kids early. Yeah, and I think just to, to echo with, with you, Jeff, um, the first thing that you need as a, as a leader is buy into you as a person. So if, if the kids are bought into their teacher and they believe their teacher cares, difference maker. As a, as a leader, if your staff believes in you and that you, you have the best interest at heart for those you're leading, they're gonna fight for you but they have to be there. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of talk about parenting stuff. I just wanted to read people. We have uh, free parenting modules. I just put the link in there. These are our free parenting modules that we created based on feedback from all of you who went through Reimagine last spring. If you went through Reimagine last spring, we also reached out to a bunch of parent groups. Uh, these are free modules. You're allowed to take them, use them, steal them, adapt them. They are given away under a Creative Commons 4.0 license. Uh, so those are there for you. So. Um, to be able to take those and use those. Those are there. Anybody's allowed to use them. And I'm excited. Keep checking back to that website. We're working with the state. They are going to be putting those in nine different languages that should be coming soon, uh, including they'll be available for people who are hearing impaired or who might uh, be sight impaired. Uh, so all of that is coming too. So we're very excited about doing that work with the state. So so one of the things that's that's popping up is all these things. And I think it was Carolyn just talked about the prices, right? Music, puppets teaching second grade. Oh my gosh, that is, that is a story, by the way. So much fun. I, and, and, and for me, that, that is a story. It's a vehicle to get kids' attention, put it in their terms. I, I just get excited about that kind of creativity to create that connection, that impact. Really, I, just phenomenal. Karen, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing incredible work, people. You are all doing incredible work. hundred percent. You're doing incredible work on behalf of your kids. Thank you for being here. Dan, thank you for giving us your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, really appreciate it.
Uh, we'll be having these uh, every, well, not every Thursday, but every week. Be checking the shiftingschools.com website. You can look for more of these coming up. Uh, or if you're part of the Reimagine program, you're gonna be getting emails. If you're not getting emails from us, check your spam, junk mail, make sure we get us out of there. Uh, we'll make sure you have these next week. We'll be back with another one of these. We're going to have the one and only Tyler Rablin, who I believe is here in the, he, I saw oh, him in Tyler. the room. Tyler's here to talk about assess. There he is. He's going to be back here to talk about assessment and grade books. And I've got a, got a feeling the whole reimagined team's probably going to end up on the panel with him at some point. So if you want to talk about assessment and stuff next week, we will be here. Uh, the registration links again, will be on shiftingschools.com or somewhere in the uh, reimagined website. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Really thank you everybody. This will also be out on YouTube shortly and it'll be part of the podcast next week's episode. Uh, so a lot of different ways to go back and rewatch this, listen it and share it with your friends. So thanks everyone. Till next time. Take care everybody. Thank you for being here.